Welcome, everybody. Anybody here for their first time tonight? Welcome to all of you. Welcome back to everybody else. We um, are a meditation center against the streams, a Buddhist community. And um, one of the core kind of foundations, what's called refuges in Buddhism, is community is um, gathering together. One of the things that the Buddha said was that if people gather together in person, not just online, <laughs> but actually you know, have gatherings and discuss the Dharma and practice the Dharma, that this uh, tradition will continue. The Dharma is the word that we use for the Buddha's teachings, the, the truth of, of reality that he experienced and that he uh, taught and, and that these Meditation practices give us the opportunity to experience directly for ourselves. So um, my main intention in having a meditation center is a, a place for people to gather and build community and learn and, and practice the Dharma. So welcome, everybody. And we um, like to start, I like to encourage you to start uh, taking a couple minutes, introduce yourself to some of the people around you that you don't know yet, a bunch of new people here tonight. Don't be creepy and culty, but be friendly. I'll talk a little bit tonight uh, to set up what we're going to do in the meditation practice. Um, the topic is uh, developing and uncovering a sense of appreciation for happiness, for other people's happiness. Uh, what we sometimes, the, the Buddhist word is mudita, and often translated as appreciative joy of taking joy, of letting your, your heart, your mind rejoice in someone else's happiness. And um, this, is one, this is a very, my, my experience and my uh, feeling is that this is one of the reasons why the Buddha said this path goes against the stream. Because jealousy, envy, self-centeredness, Comparing mind, judging mind, self-centeredness is really easy, <laughs> is totally natural to human beings. Taking pleasure and celebrating and enjoying other people's happiness, people who are having more success than you, more joy than you, more so easy to get petty about it. To maybe even suffer about it. We have, you know, so many words for the kind of suffering that we experience about other people's happiness and success. All of Buddhism is um, with one goal, and that is to end suffering. To see clearly what's causing unhappiness and suffering in our lives. And to transform, to awaken. And no longer suffer. So reflecting on your life. Living in this world. Reflect on all of the times you suffered about what someone else had and you didn't have. Whether that was materially or a relationship that you felt some suffering of jealousy in or a relationship that you felt some insecurity and you're afraid someone else was going to. I, I didn't I actually don't know. I didn't know until <laughs> just recently. Um, what was the difference between Jealousy and envy. Do you know? I was I was here the other night at Jason's class, and he he was on Wednesday night, and he was talking about this topic, and and I asked him. I was the difficult student. I said, "Well, what's the difference between jealousy and envy?" Because I I think I conflate them. I think that I think that they're the same thing. And um, the I'll 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 answer it because we looked it up. We we Googled it. Envy is when you're um, 
suffering about wanting something that someone else has, that you are envious of somebody else's possessions. It's a material, suffering about materialism. Envious, I want that. And so it could be a, position, a possession or a position or fame or something like that, suffering, envious. And jealousy is very much, uh, the definition is, it's relational. It's um, jealous of someone else's attention towards somebody that you're in a relationship with or wanting what someone else, they're, the relational jealousy is about relationships, envy is about position or possession. You suffer about that in your life some? Once or twice? Some jealousy, some envy? So the, the Buddha looked at the human condition and he said, how do we suffer? Oh, we suffer in all of these different ways, our clinging, our craving, our aversion, jealousy and envy and covetousness, coveting that which somebody else has. has. He did the mindfulness-based practices of turning towards present-time awareness, what's happening here, what's happening now. How does it feel? Really investigating our, ple our uh, relationship to pleasure and to pain. Seeing the natural human tendency to cling to pleasure. Survival instinct dictates attachment, clinging. But also survival instinct causes suffering when we cling, when we experience attachment to impermanent people, places, things, sensations, emotions, thoughts, feelings, the outcome of clinging is suffering, is unhappiness, is stress, is sorrow. We call it dukkha. And came to understand that non-attachment was the goal, was the liberating experience, the potential of our human heart and mind is to train it so thoroughly that we understand impermanence and we stop clinging. We break through the craving cycles, the repetitive, the second noble truth is not just craving, it's the understanding that craving is repetitive. It's not like you, once in a while you have a craving, that there's this sort of constant cycle, repetitive cycle of craving for, mostly for pleasure. When you see that in your life that you want there's always sort of this feeling of it's not quite right. Even if it's pretty good, do you usually have a sense how you could make it better? <laughs> Whether it's something that you're eating or something that you're doing or, you know, experience that you're having, there's this human tendency of like, it's pretty good, but it could be better. Um, it could last longer. It could be bigger. There could be more craving. So again, my sense is that um, it was a mindfulness-based awakening that the Buddha had. He saw everything's impermanent, this human condition, and we cling, and that way we suffer, or, or the pain comes, and we don't meet it with compassion. I spent the last week talking about loving kindness before that, uh, compassion. He said, when I woke up to the reality, to the world as it is, all that remained uh, in the awakened heart and mind was a sense of uh, loving kindness for all living beings. Last week we did loving kindness as a practice. A sense of compassion for all of the pain in the world. No longer meeting it with aversion and judgment and hatred, but just opening the heart and caring about the pain in the world, the pain in our own heart and mind and in each other. He said, and when it came to pleasure and the happiness that does exist in the world, there was no more jealousy, no more envy, no more suffering about other people's happiness, but a natural celebratory response that he called mudita, a sympathetic joy. And I, I like this to think about uh, empathizing and, and sympathizing. Maybe empathizing is a better word.
I know there's been a sort of I feels it feels like there's been a trend that I've noticed on social media or spiritual circles where everyone's an empath. They've labeled themselves of I'm 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 extra empathetic. More than you. I'm so sensitive and empathetic that uh, it's hard for me in this world because I feel everything deeply. Maybe that's true and I'm dissing a little bit. Yes, I am dissing a little bit. A lack of empathy for the empaths. (laughs) I tend to think of empathy as towards uh, pain. When you think of empathy, do you... It means feeling with, something like that, feeling with. But generally, I, I would think of empathy as in like empathetic and compassionate, like with, in response to pain, I empathize with how hard your life is, your suffering, your difficulties. But what the Buddha is saying and what, he's, what this practice that we're going to do tonight is opening our heart, empathizing with other people's happiness, not their sorrow both, right? Compassion is for the pain and the sorrow. Sympathetic joy is empathizing with other people's happiness and really training your heart. He said, this is what remains, the awakened heart, no jealousy or feeling less than or left out, just a feeling of good for you. You're doing well in your life. I'm happy for you. You're happy. I celebrate your happiness. I enjoy it. I actually empathize and feel good about your joy, about your happiness, about your successes. Make sense, theoretically? Do you experience that a lot? Some of you do probably have some tastes of that. It's easier with like people that you really love that are like, you know, if you really love someone, hopefully um, you're like, oh yeah, wow, I'm really happy for you. You got to, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a raise, you got a, you know, you got a, um, you were successful in some way. Like, if you really love somebody, it's, you can feel happy for them most of the time. But what about strangers that are doing well? What about, what about people that you don't like very much <laughs> that are doing really well? that are super happy, and you're like, oh, fuck that person. They don't deserve it. And we suffer about other people's happiness. Haven't you seen that in your life, like suffering about other, in this material world? And Los Angeles feels like a, especially if you have a lot of material desires, and you're just seeing like $300,000 cars drive by you every day, and you're like, you know, I don't have a Bentley. Or, you know, you're not Bentley, you don't covet Bentleys, but we're spiritual, so, you know, Tesla. (laughs) Driving this shitty Prius, I want a Tesla. And just, you know, watching how the mind works into, you know, Priuses used to be super cool before Teslas. And you were like, I got a Prius, I'm an eco-warrior. We're going to get there. <laughs> Maybe some. I don't know Michael very well. How about the rest of this cohort? So going in airs. So we're going to get there because th- this is important heckling that I'm getting here. Uh, this is sorry. No, this is no, it's it's this is key. I do. I lo- I love I love you. I empathize. Um uh, this is um, important because when we're, we are talking about, we need to have some discernment. It's not just success and materialism. Uh, would, I think the, way, the best way to frame it that I can think of is taking pleasure in other people's happiness and success that is well-earned. That is earned through skillful means. Because the, especially when we look at material things, as, 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 as Alan is pointing out, sometimes you look at billionaires or people who've, you know, uh, material are very successful and seem like, well, they should be happy. Although if you really sat them down, most of them would probably admit that they're not all that happy 
and so that there's not a lot to empathize with as far as happiness. But materially, they, you know, have been very successful. And when, when it comes to that, we have to look through the lens of karma. And is the experience that you're having, whether it's pleasure or material, is it karmically wholesome? Is it well earned? Is it skillfully obtained? Because we do not want to develop a feeling of appreciation for people who are actually hurting themselves. Does it make sense? Because if you're lying, stealing, cheating to get ahead, and you're making all of this money, and you're hurting people, you don't want to be like, oh, I'm so happy for your success. Because actually, if you see a little bit deeper, what you see is somebody who's creating a lot of suffering for themselves and other people, no matter how many zeros are in their bank account. If it's not well earned, what they're actually doing is creating suffering. And for many, maybe for many, I, I don't want to get into a full on class war here, but maybe for many of the billionaires that you're talking about, compassion is a more appropriate response than appreciative joy. Maybe. So you have to look through that lens. I don't know, Michael. I don't, I'm not even so sure about, you know, his politics or how he's made his money or any of that. Um, but maybe it's compassion. Maybe it, there's some appreciation. Maybe there's, it's, you know, all human beings have some mixture. Um, I mean, we can talk about Donald Trump. Clearly, compassion and forgiveness, from my perspective, is what is uh, an appropriate response to someone that seems to be that confused, ignorant, deluded, suffering. No matter, you know, not, not appreciative joy, but compassion and forgiveness would be uh, the target in my, from my perspective not uh, not appreciative joy. So we do want to bring discernment to our meditation practice. We're not just saying like, I'm super happy for everyone who's rich. I'm super happy for everyone who's successful, no matter how they got there. I'm super happy. You know, it's not that it's not that blanket. It's a development of the, the heart state, the mind state that says for all of the joy in this world, that is skillful, that is well-earned, I want to learn to appreciate that. The stuff that's real. I want to learn to appreciate that. I want to open my heart. I want to empathize and connect with the, the true happiness. In the loving kindness practice last week, we used one of the phrases was, uh, may all beings be happy. And sometimes, I don't remember if I said it last week or not, but sometimes I say, um, truly happy, not the kind of happiness that is fleeting, not the kind of happiness that is, um, you know, based on temporary pleasure, but a true, a deep happiness that's more like contentment. It's more like being at ease in their own skin. Um, there's one list in the suttas that I think is appropriate here where the Buddha says there are four types of happiness that we can experience. And we could send some level of appreciative joy to all four of these types. He said the first one is sense pleasures. He said it's, you know, and it's the <coughs> lowest form. The lowest form of human happiness is sense pleasure. Right? Well, actually, I'm not sure which one is lower. The second one is material things. So these two, materialism and sense pleasures, do give us a temporary sense of happiness, right? Like, you, you like stuff. <laughs> you can admit it. You don't have to be so spiritual. Be like, yeah, when I get some stuff that I like, temporarily feel a little bit happy. You know, the important part is here, temporarily. Have you ever gotten anything that is, makes you happy forever? Have you ever got that? that purchase that was just like, I got that and I was so happy about it and I'm still just as happy as I was then. Like it just is permanent until your dog dies. <laughs> Impermanent, right? Like it just doesn't, 
Yeah, and I'm not sure if we can call a living being a material possession, but yes, it, it is on some level. It's a companion. It's a, but also it's impermanent. Beginning, middle, end to that lifespan. So sense pleasures and material. Again, when we're talking about sense pleasures, skillful, appropriate sense pleasures. Then you say, hey, I'm happy for you. You're enjoying that delicious meal. You're in that honeymoon phase of your relationship, having sex every day. I'm happy for you. Enjoy that. It's, you know, it's appropriate. It's, you know, you celebrate that. Um, material things that are well-learned, appropriately earned. The higher forms of happiness, um, the way that I hear it and, and think about it, is the happiness of debtlessness and the happiness of blamelessness. <laughs> so developing a quality where you're actually looking at people and you're saying, you know, is this somebody who has that kind of happiness? Do you have the happiness of debtlessness? Now, being free from debt, the Buddha is referring to money. And, uh, you know, in this ancient Buddhist culture that he's coming from, people who are like indentured servants, you know, not, not just the mortgage and the credit cards, but like your family will work for this kingdom for generations. Like you are indebted and, you know, you will work the fields and you'll never really pay off your debt. And, so when you, and when you, if you get free from that kind of debt, there's a real sense of like, wow, I have freedom. I'm not in debt. I can do, I don't have to continue to be an indentured servant. I've paid off my debt. I'm free. So, and maybe some of you have experienced that, where you pay off your credit cards, you pay off your student loans. Does it feel good to pay off your student loans? If you did. Pay off a, a house, pay off a... There's some personal happiness, freedom, and not being in debt. I believe there's another level here that we're talking about also, which is like emotional debt. Having forgiven everyone having asked for forgiveness to everyone, no longer owing amends, no longer owing even a debt of gratitude. You know, there's those, sometimes there's that feeling of like, man, people have been so generous to me, I could never pay it back. And then you live your life in such a way, and you're generous to others, and you give, and you feel like, I've, I've paid my debt. I don't owe. I've balanced the karmic bank accounts. I've given back so much. And I think that this is important for us individually to work towards. Many um, people in, in, our, in this room, in our community, um, have been just completed uh, doing this practice called a year to live. And we said, if we have a year to live, you want to die free from debt, not owing anybody amends, not owing anybody a debt of gratitude, write the letters, tell those people in your life that were important to you, thank you, so that you could die, if you were really going to die, that you could die with a feeling of, I took the action, I made the uh, gratitude, and I, and I made the amends, I asked for forgiveness, I offered forgiveness, so that you can be debtless. So, think, you know, when you're thinking about this joy, there are people living uh, skillful and wise and debtless, not just financially, but living in a way, which is the, the last one, living in a way that is blameless. Blameless in the eyes of the wise is the way we talk about it. Living in a, you know, the five precepts, living in a way that's nonviolent, that's honest, that's careful, that's skillful, that's sober, that's awake. I've been in recovery for a long time. A lot of our communities, recovering addicts, alcoholics. We have the, um, Tradition in the 12-step world and a little bit in, in our refuge recovery world of um, celebrating people's anniversaries. 
And that's such a time to, to have this experience of mudita of like, wow, you're celebrating a year of, of, you know, escaping the suffering of addiction or five years or 10 years or, and really, and rarely, I don't know if any, has any, anybody suffered about like jealousy around like, yeah, fuck George and his 20 years. <laughs> I want to have 20 years. I'll be happy when I have 20 years. It's not, it's not like that. It's like, wow, it's amazing. I can't believe you have 20 years. That's, you know, you've, you've made it. You got a, two X's. And it's celebration. <coughs> Blameless in the eyes of the wise. Um, because no matter, and I always want to just go back to the Buddha. I mean, do you, do you think the Buddha was a pretty righteous person? Hopefully. We don't fucking know, really. But it sounds like this was like an awakened being. He was a human being that developed compassion for everyone and appreciation and lived his life, you know, in a really wise and skillful, generous way and was blameless and, and impeccable in his behavior, but he was criticized and judged and blamed and accused of terrible things over and over in his lifetime. So when we talk about blameless, it's not like there's going to be zero blame in the world around blameless people. Blameless in the eyes of the wise. People hated the Buddha because he believed in equality, because he empowered women because he was trying to break down the racist, sexist uh, caste system that he you know, was born into. He was despised because he uh, was a bit of an atheist. So the theists were like, fuck this guy. You know, so the Buddha was, he was radical because he was righteous. And people hate radically righteous people. <laughs> you know, the asleep people that have power structures and, you know, religions to defend and, you know, you get a lot of blame. So when you're thinking about blamelessness, it's about uh, spiritual integrity, not um, that, that society won't criticize you. It's not free from criticism. Make sense? You following me? Where we're going here, which is trying to develop a sense of empathy and appreciation and connection to the true happiness that does exist in this world. Whether it's sensual or material or financial or emotional or blamelessness. Because it's so easy. Uh, I, I was reading a neuroscience thing one time and it said um the part of our brains that focuses on pain and remembers pain is like it's almost like it's velcro like the painful stuff sticks it's why we hold on to resentment it's why we replay it's why like our survival instinct is just like what's wrong with this fucking scenario with these people with this world am i safe we're not wired to be like, what's beautiful? <laughs> what am I grateful for? What's going right here? What should I, you know, what can I meet with appreciation? Who's happy? We're not scanning the room for like, who's happy? We're scanning the room for threats. Am I safe? Am I, you know, we're not like going around being like, man, let me look into your heart for a minute. See if you're a beautiful heart. I want to like take it. Let me get a hit of that. We're just kind of, you know, in our own self-centered fear most of the time. And so this practice, again, my sense is you take mindfulness all the way, this will happen naturally to you. You will become appreciative, you'll become empathetic, you'll no longer cling to pleasure, but you'll meet it with non-attached appreciation. You'll no longer experience jealousy or envy. You'll just be like, good for you. And, you know, you'll look a little bit deeper into 
what people are experiencing and see, oh, is, you know, you were very, you're very successful. You know, was that well learned? Should I be sending you compassion for your success? <laughs> Should I be sending you forgiveness for your success? Because you, you know, it wasn't well earned and it was, you know, you hurt a lot of people on the way up the ladder. It was all, you know, made all of your money in sweatshops. Wow, you made a lot of money. That's a lot of karma you got in there. Or did you actually do it in a way that was wise and didn't hurt a whole bunch of people? And I'm a big, uh, I'm an optimist. I believe that actually it's fine to make money and that there's ways to make money that don't hurt people. And probably that most of the time it's easier to make more money if you're willing to hurt people. And that most people in our uh, world and in our capitalist society are much more interested in the dollar than in kindness or compassion. Much more interested in the bottom lines than in karma. Before we go into the guided meditation, any questions about what we're trying to develop? Again, in a simple way, empathy and appreciation for the well-learned happiness of others is the teaching. Okay. Um, stretch for a moment if you'd like. This is not a break. Let's maintain silence or we'll meditate.